Hey, and welcome back to another episode of Ghost Countries. Today, we're going to be looking into the history behind one of Australia's seven external territories, Christmas Island. And yeah, this is going to be our Christmas episode. I mean, it's in the name, so festive, right? Sometimes said to be the Galapagos of the Indian Ocean, this geographically isolated island is home to a number of endemic species, including the Christmas Island red crab, which every year at the beginning of the wet season, roughly November to December, migrates in mass from the island's forested interior to the coast. An estimated 40 to 50 million crabs undertake this rather perilous journey to breed and or release their eggs into the sea, although the island's residents do their best to, you know, make it a little easier for them. And while the red crab is probably Christmas Island's best-known crustacean, it by no means is the only one. You've also got the so-called coconut or robber crab, the world's largest anthropoid, which can measure 3 feet 3 inches, or about 1 meter in length, and weighs some 9 pounds, or 4.1 kilograms. There's also the purple crab, blue crab, brown crab, yellow nipper, Chinese ghost crab, uh, a lot of crabs. But, surprisingly enough, it wasn't crabs that brought settlers to the island in the late 1800s, but the discovery of an incredibly pure phosphate, which actually is quite similar to Minami Torishima, another island we covered in length. And that seems a good enough opportunity as any for a plug. If you haven't checked out those episodes, click the cards above me, it's a two-parter. There will also be links in the description down below. So, with all of that out of the way, let's officially kick off the episode. Some 870 miles or 1400 kilometers northwest of Australia, Christmas Island sits just south of Java, which is located about 224 miles or 360 kilometers to its north. The island has an area of roughly 52 square miles or 135 square kilometers and, at its highest point, Murray Hill, rises some 1184 feet or 361 meters from the sea. Rugged cliffs encircle the island's coastline, with much of the interior being monsoonal or seasonal tropical forest. The island's population, as of 2016, was said to be around 2,000 people, the vast majority of which live in Christmas Island's capital and largest city, Flying Fish Cove. The overwhelming majority of Christmas Islanders are of Chinese ancestry. However, there are also sizable Australian, European, and Malay populations. Again, going off 2016 data, just under 40% of Christmas Islanders are Australian-born. English is the most common language, and recently, Islam overtook Buddhism as the island's most common religious affiliation. That being said, 38.4% of those surveyed were reported as either unspecified and or having no religion. Okay, so that's a basic overview of Christmas Island today. A little heavy on statistics, I know, but how did the island come to be a part of Australia? And where did it get its Yule time name from? Well, first sighted in 1615 by a certain Richard Rowe, master of the Thomas, of whom I can find virtually nothing about, the island was later named on Christmas Day, 1643, by Captain William Miners of the Royal Mary, a British East India Company vessel. William Dampier, an English explorer who, among other things, was one of the first Europeans to use the word avocado and describe the making of guacamole, then aboard the reluctant buccaneer Charles Swan's ship, the Signet, which I just learned is a word for young swan, made the first recorded landing on Christmas Island in March 1688. He found it uninhabited, and besides noting a land animal somewhat resembling a large crawfish, more than likely a robber crab, which his crew brought back on board to eat, he mentions little else of the island. A more concerted effort to explore Christmas Island was made in 1857 by the crew of the Amethyst. However, it was during the 1872-1876 HMS Challenger expedition that a Scots-Canadian oceanographer, John Murray, carried out an extensive survey of the island, collecting mineral samples that, in his view, indicated sizable phosphate deposits. This was confirmed in later British landings on the island, and on June 6, 1888, at Murray's urging, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland annexed Christmas Island. Oh, and stepping back just a few years, in 1886, Captain John McClear of the HMS Flying Fish anchored in a bay that he later named Flying Fish Cove, the present-day capital of Christmas Island. But 
Murray wasn't the only person interested in Christmas Island's potential riches. George Clooney's Ross, a Shetlander whose family ruled the previously uninhabited Cocos Keeling Islands, some 560 miles or 900 kilometers from Christmas Island, soon sent his brother, Andrew, along with a small group of Malay workers to Flying Fish Cove, where they were to establish a settlement and preempt any claim on the island's resources. Now, to be fair, Clooney's Ross had requested the British government annex Christmas Island and grant him a lease to cut lumber as far back as 1886. That being said, his actions in 1888 obviously didn't go over so well with Murray, and a rather intense rivalry developed between the two. Then, in 1891, Britain offered Clooney's Ross and Murray a 99-year joint lease. Six years later, the rivals were induced to form the Christmas Island Phosphate Company, and in 1898, 200 Chinese laborers, eight European managers, and five Sikh policemen arrived on the island as part of the newly formed company's workforce. The first major shipment of phosphate left Christmas Island in 1900, but life on the island was difficult to say the least. Not unlike George Clooney's Ross forebearer, John, who made use of Japanese convicts as laborers on the Cocos Keeling Islands, indentured laborers from China and later the Malay Archipelago were rather common on Christmas Island. These laborers were underpaid, overworked, and had little in terms of legal rights. And, if things couldn't get worse, in the first years of the 20th century, from roughly 1900 to 1904, an outbreak of beriberi occurred, which killed 550 people, most of them Chinese laborers. For those of you who don't know, beriberi is a severe and chronic form of thiamine deficiency, which generally is broken down into three types. Wet beriberi, which affects the cardiovascular system, causing an irregular heartbeat, shortness of breath, and swelling of the legs. Dry beriberi, which affects the peripheral nervous system, resulting in numbness, trouble moving, confusion, and pain, and gastrointestinal beriberi. A major risk factor, which may be relevant in the Christmas Island outbreak, is a poor diet that consists overwhelmingly of white rice. While rare nowadays, it was common in Asia for thousands of years and may have actually become more common in the late 1800s with increased processing of rice. Anyway, 1900 also marked the year Christmas Island was incorporated into the British Crown Colony of the Straits Settlements. It was also around this time that a certain John Davis Murray, a mechanical engineer who graduated from Purdue University over in the United States, found employment with the Christmas Island Phosphate Company. And yes, we've got multiple Murrays in this story. He soon gained the moniker King of Christmas Island, and he administered the laws, held court, decided disputes between workmen, and held absolute authority over them, and his decrees were carried out with promptness and vigor. That is, until 1910, when King John was in London, where he fell in love with a maiden and married her. But as she refused to share his throne on a savage island, he abdicated and settled in England. At least that's according to the quote. Okay, so with uh, that out of the way, let's skip ahead a few decades to the Southeast Asian theater of World War II. Christmas Island was a target of Imperial Japan owing to its phosphate deposits, and, not completely oblivious to this fact, the British installed a naval gun on the island under the Hong Kong and Singapore Royal Artillery Detachment, which consisted of one officer, Captain Leonard Walter Thomas Williams, four NCOs, and 27 Indian soldiers. This, however, did not deter a Kaidai-class Japanese submarine, the I-59, from torpedoing a Norwegian freighter in Flying Fish Cove, which drifted and eventually sank in the shallow waters off the north coast. Following this, most of the island's civilian population was evacuated to Australia. Communication with Singapore was lost on February 11th as the Japanese closed in. Just a few days later, news came the so-called Gibraltar of the East had fallen, and some 80,000 Commonwealth troops were now in Japanese captivity. Then, in early March 1942, a passing Japanese naval force shelled but did not occupy the island. Nonetheless, a decision was made to raise the white flag and dismantle the previously mentioned naval gun. This decision was reversed on March 9th, with Captain Williams ordering the Union Jack re-hoisted and the naval gun reassembled. The following night, however, Captain Williams and the four British NCOs were killed in their sleep. A certain Mr. Ali and Ghulam Qadir, both Muslims from Punjab, who had been secretly listening to Axis radio and had learnt of the establishment of a pro-Japanese Indian National Army to fight the British, had, 
days before, decided the Allies were fighting a lost cause. So, on the night of March 10th, while both were on guard duty, they unlocked the ammunition store and distributed weapons to their supporters. After killing Williams and the British NCOs, the mutineers who numbered about a dozen then confronted those among their ranks who had not partaken and or were unaware of the plot, including their superior officer, Lieutenant Muzaffar Khan. These men, most of whom had fled into the jungle when the shooting began, were themselves now ordered to wrap the bodies of the dead British soldiers in mosquito nets and throw them over a cliff into the sea. After which, Muzaffar Khan confronted Mr. Ali, who now said they would have to kill all other Europeans on the island, including civilians. To this, he responded, if you want to kill them, kill me first. Mr. Ali, though, brandishing a rifle, was now in charge and the island's remaining European population, including the district officer, were lined up and told they were going to be shot in mass. It was only after tense and prolonged negotiations between the district officer and the leaders of the mutiny this was deferred and the Europeans instead confined to the officer's residence under armed guard. Three and a half weeks later, on March 31st, some 850 to 900 Japanese soldiers landed unopposed on Christmas Island. To their astonishment, Mr. Ali, Ghulam Qadir, and the other mutineers were not honored by the Japanese and instead put to work as laborers. The Japanese, however, found the island too small to build an airstrip on, and despite its phosphate wealth, continued submarine warfare, which saw the sinking of the Nisei Maru in Flying Fish Cove on November 17th, meant little was exported during the occupation. In 1943, approximately half the island's population was deported to Java, owing to chronic food shortages, and on October 18th, Christmas Island was reoccupied by the British. Between 1947 and 1948, eight of the mutineers were captured in Java and tried by general court-martial in Singapore. Originally sentenced to death, they were later given life imprisonment. Mr. Ali, however, the arguable leader of the mutiny itself, was never found. Following World War II, the Christmas Island Phosphate Company found it difficult to re-establish operations to pre-war levels of profitability. And so, on August 31, 1948, a decision was made to sell the company and its assets to Australia and New Zealand. These countries, in turn, employed the British Phosphate Commissioners, BPC, as their managing on-the-ground agents, and thus, BPC in effect controlled mining operations on Christmas Island. However, the island itself remained administered by the colony of Singapore. As mining operations resumed, laborers from Singapore, Malaya, the Cocos Keeling Islands, alongside staffers from Australia, continued to pour in, expanding the tiny island's population. Then, in 1958, an agreement between Australia and the colony of Singapore was reached, in which Christmas Island was excised from the latter and made a separate crown colony. This paved the way for the United Kingdom to transfer sovereignty to Australia, which it did on October 1, 1958 a day still celebrated as Territory Day on Christmas Island. In compensation for lost phosphate royalties, the Australian government agreed to pay Singapore £2.9 million, and D.E. Nichols was appointed the first official representative of the new territory. And with that, Christmas Island officially became a part of Australia. Oh, and a similar process occurred with the Cocos Keeling Islands in 1955. Which brings us to the end of this episode. So, despite its size and distance from Australia, Christmas Island has played a rather interesting role over the years. As part of the so-called Pacific Solution, which sought to address the asylum seeker issue in Australia, Christmas Island would uh, host an immigration reception and processing center, and more recently, it also had a quarantine center. So, despite its size and distance, Christmas Island actually features somewhat prominently in Australian politics. Yeah, so if you made it through the whole video, thank you very much. That helps with the algorithm quite a lot. Of course, you can always subscribe, like, comment, and share this video if you haven't done so already. And we'll see you again next time. Peace!